let me just say a couple things to you. Uh, I'm not here because uh, I have to be or any kind of obligation. I'm here because I want to be. I enjoy what I'm doing. Um, there are two things that are very important in my life. One of them is history, which I taught at Coatesville High School for 42 years, and one is Coatesville. I'm not from this area. I'm from the Pittsburgh area originally, but I've been here for 44 years, and Coatesville has become a very important part of my life. I think you people who live here should know something about the place where you live. A lot of things happened here that maybe you're not aware of. This town has a very rich history. I know we're going through bad times now. All of you know that. But whatever was can be again if people want to work at it and not let this community go down the tubes. Um, I always usually start my history classes when I was a teacher here by asking a question. And I'm only asking you for one thing. Be honest with your answer. I'm going to give you three choices. <coughs> Three or this. One, I don't like history. I've never liked it. I don't get it. I don't like it. Number two, history's okay. It's all right. It's no big thing. It's not the big greatest thing in my life. I don't hate it. It's okay. Number three, I like history. I've always liked it. It's one of my favorite subjects. I enjoy it. Okay, you ready? Number one, raise your hand. I don't like history. Come on, you people aren't being honest with me. Ms. Ellis is going to grade you down if you say that. Thank you. I appreciate it. Number two, it's okay. Number three, I like it. Okay, that's good. For most of you <coughs> who said that you don't like it or it's just okay, let me see if I can tell you what the problem is with history and people your age. I don't care what happened in 1750. I don't care what happened in 1880. I'm not even too thrilled about what happened day before yesterday. Is that about it? I'm interested in my life now. You know, now, today. What's going to happen this weekend, uh, et cetera, et cetera. That's okay, people. Don't feel badly if that's how you feel. I don't care what happened in 1750 either, or 1880 either, if it has no impact on my life. But I think it does. I think what happened in the past is what we are today and why we are where we are, et cetera. Did you ever ask yourself, why does Coatesville have such a large black population? When 20 miles down the road, they don't. And 20 miles up that way, they don't. Why is it here? Do you think that's an accident? You'll find out today why. Because of something called the Underground Railroad, which was active right underneath where you're sitting now. There's a tunnel that goes underneath this room that comes from a house over there to the foot of the hill over there. It brought black people to Coatesville. Now, they weren't supposed to stay here. They were supposed to move on to Phoenixville, north, north to Canada. But they got to Coatesville, and they said, what, what am I going to Canada for? There's no work up there. There's work here. Coatesville has two steel mills, two, Lucans and Worth Brothers. So they stayed. And World War I brought many more blacks up from the south. Lucans at that time employed 6,500 people. Now they employ 1,100. OK? There's a reason for everything, people. You can't know where you're going if you don't know where you've been. And that's why you study history. So when you leave the room today, I hope you can say, I learned one big thing about Coatesville that I didn't know before. I know one important thing that I didn't know. And maybe you'll know 50. I don't know. I hope you do. But I hope you can say, I learned one thing. And the next time you walk by places in Coatesville that I'm going to show you today, you'll say, hey, I, I remember that. Something happened there. That's the oldest house in Coatesville. President George Washington stayed there on First Avenue, okay? The house next door to Cash was a stop on the Underground Railroad, okay? There's a tunnel that goes right underneath this room and comes out over there at the foot of the hill. Just some things like that, okay, class? And can I say something else to all you people? Sometimes history never grabs you. But you know when history gets most people? When they're 30 years old or 40. 50. And when you get to be those ages, sometimes you think about what's happened in the past. When I was 17, your age, I wasn't that thrilled about history either. I didn't even go to college to be a history teacher. I was a senior in college before I made this decision. So if you people are saying, I don't really know what I want to do, don't feel bad. I was 21 years old when I made the decision about what I wanted to do. And it cost me a lot of time and a lot of money to go back to school and do something else, okay? So don't feel bad. Maybe history will never grab you as, as something you like or are interested. 
but I bet it does when you're older, when you're 30 or 40 or 50. You might say, hey, I'd like to take a drive 90 miles up the road to go to Gettysburg to see the biggest battle ever fought in, on American soil, where 51,000 casualties occurred in three days. Okay? Maybe you'd like to do that. How many people in my class have ever been to Gettysburg? Have. But was that when you were in grade school? Was that when you were in grade school? You didn't appreciate it much, did you? Be honest. I bet you would now. I bet you will when you're 50 years old. I've been there 110 times. I've taken field trips there for 35 years, three times a year. Every time I go, I learn something. Maybe just something that big, but I learn something. So I hope you get the idea, class. I like history. I'm not here doing Miss Ellis a favor. I'm not. I'm here for me, hopefully for you. And when we're done, you can say, I learned something about Coach Bill, and what I learned was very important. Okay, everybody, <clears throat> when I put a slide up on the screen, I'll give you a minute to take a look. You've seen this one for a few minutes now. Do you know where we are? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're north of Coatesville and Rock Run. We're going up the Brandywine. This railroad bridge wasn't there, of course, but this is where Coatesville got its start almost 300 years ago. Indians used to trade on this spot. The local Indians were called the Lenai Lenapes, and they met with Indians on this spot from Harrisburg area called the Susquehannas, and they would trade goods. They were joined by two white men who were from down in the Chesapeake Bay area, Peter Bazilian, that I'll tell you about in a minute, and Andrew Brainwine. Check that name, Brainwine. The Indians liked him. He was always very fair. He never cheated them in the trade, and they decided they would name the stream in his honor. In their language, it was called Wawaset, W-A-W-A-S-E-T, which in their language meant fish kill. Wawaset. This whole area was called the Wawaset Valley which might explain to you why we have food stores with the name of Wawa. That's where that came from, the Wawa food stores, all right? Um, they changed the name to the name of Brainwine, but they couldn't say his name properly. Every time they tried to say Brainwine, it came out Brandywine. So the stream has nothing to do with brandy, nothing to do with wine. It's because they couldn't say this man's name right, Andrew Brainwine. So they called the stream Brandywine. Also, everybody, that stream was much, much bigger. I have a slide I'll show you later that you'll see this stream up to here, and they called it the Brandywine River for a long time, and you'll see why. Why did Coatesville get its start right where you're looking at? Because it provided water for drinking, for fishing, and to turn the wheels of mills, like grist mills to grind up flour, or uh, sawmills to turn timber into lumber, and that's why Coatesville got its start. This is Route 82, before there was a bypass up on the hill. That's how you had to go north out of town toward Wagon Town. <coughs> so this is where we're beginning. Coatesville got its start. The Lenai Lenapes and the Susquehannas traded with Bazillion and Brainwine. They changed the name from Wawaset to Brandywine. And Coatesville got its start here because of the Brandywine, which runs through Coatesville and the East Branch, which runs through Downingtown. Okay, that's the Brandywine also. Next, please, Mr. Ellis. Now we're looking at Coatesville from up in the Rock Run area, from one of the bridges. The High Railroad Bridge was built in 1904. It cost a lot of money to build it because it was masonry made out of stone. Some people thought the Pennsylvania Railroad had spent too much money. Since 1904, that bridge has never had to be repaired. Never. There's a marker on it that says it's now a National Historic Landmark Bridge. When it was built, it was the longest masonry railroad bridge in the world. Okay? Now, in the West, they had longer bridges, but they were wooden, timber, and so on. This was masonry. This is the area of Coatesville called the Flats. West End, East End. Bridge going across the Brandywine right there. Big hotel used to sit at First Avenue and Main Street that was called the Bridge Tavern, which gave Coatesville its first name, which was Bridgetown. Bridgetown. Downingtown's first name was Milltown because they had a lot of paper mills and sawmills along the Brandywine, so they were mill town. Westchester also got its first name after a big hotel or tavern called Turk's Head. Turk's Head. And that was Westchester's name at one time. They still have a music festival in Westchester every summer called the Turk's Head Music Festival. So Westchester was Turk's Head, Downingtown was Milltown, and Coatesville was Bridgetown. I'll explain to you when we changed our name. Next one, Mr. Elf, please. Okay, everybody? Doesn't look like that now, does it? That's the grounds of uh, catch. Let's go up one, Ms. Ellis, and then we'll come back. 
Okay, that's what we're looking at now. Okay, new stadium, new school, still the vet's hospital up on the hill. Let's go back up, back up. <coughs> this is the first piece of property that was bought in the Coatesville area. That other man I mentioned, Peter Bazilian, he bought this land, 500 acres, from where you are sitting right now, 500 acres down to 10th Avenue. Bazilian bought that from the family of William Penn, the founder of Pennsylvania. And a track goes from where we are now down to 10th Avenue, the first property ever bought in Coatesville. Okay, so. And again, everyone, that's what you're looking at now and how that view has changed in the last few years. Next, please. Now, this is the sign of Bob Bazilian, and it's at the top of 10th Avenue. That's his name, Bazilian, and it basically tells you what I just did. He bought 500 acres, 1736 from William Penn. He and his wife are buried out in St. John's Churchyard in Compass. Compass is on Route 10 out toward Honeybrook. <coughs> Let me see if I can explain to you where this is, because you've driven by it or walked by it a hundred times. At the top of 10th Avenue, Oak Street goes straight ahead and Westchester Road splits and goes up the hill and makes the V. The sign is right in that V at the top of 10th Avenue. In the summer, it's hard to see because of the leaves. But the trees are bare right now, and if you drive by the top of 10th, you'll see this sign about Peter Bazilian. Next one, please. Now, this was the location of Bazilian's home in Coatesville. We are at 12th and Olive Street. This is the office of Dr. Gentile and Dr. McDevitt, the dentist. There is the vet's hospital up on the hill. <coughs> now, people, Bazilian didn't live in that home. That's a new house. That's stucco. But his house was on that spot and it was built for him by slaves. We don't think of slaves being in Coatesville, but they were. They weren't field hands, they were skilled masons, carpenters, bricklayers, and they built a home. I've been in the house, down in the basement, there are still timbers that were there from over almost 300 years ago, built by the slaves for Bazillion. It doesn't look like this now. This bare spot here, there's another house right in this area, so it's a little more cramped, if you see it today at 12th and Olive. Next, please. <coughs> Across the street at 12th and Olive was where the slaves lived. He owned eight of them. Now again, people, not in that structure, but on that spot. When I came to Coatesville, that building was called the Normandy Apartments. Before then, you're looking at Coatesville's first hospital. That was Coatesville's hospital, 16 rooms. They called it the Drumpelier Hospital because the east end of Coatesville was known as the Drumpelier section. Then they built a new hospital over in the west end, which you people know as Harrison House. That was the hospital. Then they built a new one up on the hill, okay? But on this spot, at 12th and Olive, was where Brazilian slaves lived when they built that home for him across the street. Next, please. <coughs> this is right outside the grounds of Cash. <coughs> you go out the stone fence, turn left like you're going to the Dairy Queen or McDonald's, and this sign is new. It's been put there in the last six months. At one time, people, Route 30 was called the Lancaster Philly Turnpike and it cost you money to use it. If you were going out of Philly to Lancaster and you wanted to use what we call the Lincoln Highway, you had to pay money. It was surfaced with crushed stone. And they'll tell you, it was built in 1792, state legislature. You had to stop in Coatesville at 4th Avenue and pay money. And I'll show you where that stop was. But you had to stop at 4th Avenue, pay money to keep on going. Now, King's Highway up on the hill was dirt, so it was free. And a lot of people coming out of Philly still went to Lancaster by using King's Highway rather than pay the money to use Lincoln Highway. <coughs> Next, please. Unfortunately, recently, I don't know what's happened, but when you go out the grounds of cash, turn right as if you're going over the new bridge, and this sign was there a month ago. It's gone now. I don't know what's happened. I've already called the Cowan police and reported it because they didn't know it and they think maybe the Cowan Historical Society has taken it down uh, to fix it up because it was fading pretty badly. It's about a man who would live here named John Park. Parksburg is named after his family. He was the man who settled the border between the United States and Canada. He had a long border that we were arguing about. Park is the man who made the decision on the border. He was also superintendent of West Point in New York, a very prestigious job held one time by Robert E. Lee and held at one time by Douglas MacArthur. I hope it's not the result of vandalism that somebody just taking that sign down. I don't know what anybody would want it for. 
but uh, uh, the police are checking out. When you go out again, the gates of cash and turn right, that would be signed right there. If you go, all you'll see now is the blue pole. But this is about a famous man who lived in our area, and Parksburg is named after his family. Next, please. <coughs> okay, anybody? Know where we are? <clears throat> That's a crooked house on Harmony Street, okay? Between 5th and 6th on Harmony. You people who don't know the city of Coatesville that well, go down to the library at 5th, turn left. Turn immediately left again on Harmony Street behind the Baptist Church, and this is the house. It's called the Crooked House because it sits crooked to the street. It wasn't built crooked, it's just at an angle. All these are row homes, and they face the street. This is the oldest house in Coatesville. Date on it, 1716. The only building around here that's older is the White Log Cabin in Downingtown, 1701 on the Log Cabin. William Fleming built this house, and he built it this way at that angle because there wasn't any road there. There was a creek that ran in front of his house, and he could look out his windows and check on his farm, and his farm was downtown Coatesville. That was all the farm owned by William Fleming. So the next time if you go up Harmony Street and check it out, that looks pretty much as it looks now. You'll know that's the oldest house still standing in Coatesville. It's 284 years old. The Fleming House on Harmony Street. Next, please. <coughs> We're now in the West End. And this is the oldest home in the West End. The man on Harmony Street was William Fleming. This is the home of his grandson, John Fleming. 1785. That's a new section. That's a new section. There's the part that goes back to 1785. Now let me see if I can find a spot for you. If you went into that parking lot, which is roped off in this picture, you'd be going into the Little Chef. Okay? The Little Chef on Strode Avenue. This house is actually at Strode Avenue and Valley Road. And the Little Chef restaurant sits right about here. Trees have grown up around it. You can't see it too well. But as I said, this middle section is the part of, seven, of the house that was built in 1785. And the West End wasn't called West End. It was called Midway because it was about halfway between Philly and Lancaster. Even when we were uh, called Bridgetown, this was Midway. When we changed to Coatesville, this was still called Midway. They had a hot dog and beer place over in the West End. They lost their lease and had to move down. So they moved to 7th and Main Street in Coatesville, and it's still called Midway. Because at one time, it was in the West End when that whole area was called Midway. Okay. This is house is not far from cash. Go past the Coca-Cola plant, turn left, and start up the hill. This is the first house you come to on your left. This house was lived in, is lived in by people named Rosser. But at one time, that was the home of Moses Coates, the man Coatesville is named after. He lived here when he was a teenager. When he got more money and opened a sawmill, he moved into First Avenue. When he died in 1812, they changed the name from Bridgetown to Coates Villa, meaning Coates' home, Coates Villa, and then Coatesville, okay? So it was in 1812. By the way, some of you may or may not know, the only city in Chester County is Coatesville. We are the only city. Downingtown, Westchester, Phoenixville, Paoli, they're all boroughs. Different form of government, different form of taxation. Coatesville is the only city. And I think we were incorporated as a city in 1876, but I'm not exactly sure of that date. But Coatesville is the only city. This is the home of Moses Coates, the man Coatesville is named after. Next, please. <clears throat> then when he got that sawmill, he moved into town, became wealthy. You know where we are? First Avenue. This is the old Lucan's Company store. But that's the home where Moses Coates lived, called the Brandywine Mansion. Next, please, Ron. It looks a little more like that now, although that yellow color has faded. Coatesville downtown has four buildings noted as National Historic Landmarks. That's what this sign is doing here. I'll show you all four before the presentation is over today. The famous people of Coatesville lived in this house. Fleming, the guy from Harmony Street, moved in here. Rebecca Lucas, the lady who started the mill, lived here. Pennock, her dad, uh, Coates lived here, okay? And this is the one place in town that we have evidence that President George Washington stayed. People, there was no Washington, D.C. back in the 1790s. That was being built. The nation's capital was Philly. And Washington lived in Philly, the nation's capital. He went out to Western PA as far as Bedford to check on something called the Whiskey Rebellion 
when farmers refused to pay tax on whiskey. He checked on that event. Coming back to Philadelphia, he stopped in Bridgetown, stayed overnight with Moses Coates here, had dinner with him, slept the night, then the next day went on to Philly, back to a nation's capital. So you always hear about Washington slept here. Well, in Coatesville, he did, on this house in First Avenue. Next step. <clears throat> and I'm sure you've driven by that or walked by that a hundred times. Maybe next time you'll take a look. Basically, what it tells you is the famous people who have lived in this house at one time or another, okay? And uh, unfortunately, the company stores closed up and the building's getting a little deteriorated. But it's one of the four National Historic Landmarks buildings on First Avenue. Okay, Ms. Ellis, next please. <clears throat> this is the table on which Coates and Washington had dinner. There's a plaque, this brass plaque right there tells you that Coates and Washington had dinner on this table in 1794. Now, this table was in a hotel in downtown Coatesville called the Coach and Four. It's not there anymore. The Coach and Four today is the senior citizens high rise at 4th Avenue. But when they tore the hotel down to make room for that high rise, they did save this table and it's now in a museum in the Society, Historical Society of Westchester. But that's the table on which Coates and Washington had their dinner. Next, please. Okay. Check that one out now. That's the one you see every day. Look at the barns. Garden area. Nothing back here. Cars from the late 40s, early 50s. But check the white pillars on the porch. That'll give you the clue as to what you're looking at. Next one, please. Okay. That's the administration building at Cash. All the barns are gone. There's Coatesville High School. The parking lot. But the white pillars are still there. That's kind of different. This has been added. They've added on to that building like four or five times. But that was the Gardner House. So let's go back to the Gardner House. Myself. Let's go back. Now, this home was built in 1812. If you remember, the man who owned all this property was Bazillion. He gave that land to his niece as a wedding present. She married Dr. Gardner, and they built this home in the year 1812. The main thing about the house is big time stop on the Underground Railroad. Slaves escaping from the South would come to a jump off point in Bloomington, Delaware, which was a slave state, Delaware. Then follow Route 82. From Wilmington, they'd stop in Kennett Square, Unionville, Ursulton, out by South Brandywine, Coatesville, the next stop being Phoenixville. There's a tunnel that goes from this house right underneath Cash and comes out at the foot of the hill over by the Vets Hospital. Now, I've been in that tunnel on a couple of occasions. Unfortunately, it got too unsafe. It was caving in. They were afraid of lawsuits. So a gentleman one day from the maintenance department called me over, took me down in the basement, said, take your last look. We have to brick up the tunnel. It's becoming unsafe. So it's bricked up at this end. It's bricked up over at that end. And it's just not accessible anymore. When I went into it, it was so small, people, that you could not walk through it. You had to, like, get down and go through it hunched over. Um, they used to have a little jockey, a black jockey, holding a lantern on the lawn. Have you ever seen those lawn figures? If the lantern was lit, that meant it was safe. Come on in. If the lantern couldn't be lit, you couldn't see it in daytime, they would uh, wrap yellow ribbons around the tree, meaning welcome. If you didn't see the banner, the yellow ribbons, or if you didn't see the light on being held by the jockey, then you better go somewhere else. And that somewhere else was up on King's Highway, which I'll show you in a little bit, too. The Gardner House, people, big time stop on the Underground Railroad. The reason so many slaves came to Coatesville in the first place and decided to stay because their attitude was going north. What am I going to do? Here, I'll get a job. Lucans are work brothers, so Coatesville's black population got its beginning here and the fact of the stop on the Underground Railroad. Uh, next. <coughs> and again, that's what we look like today. Okay, we can go on. Now, we're at the top of the hill. Go up Callan Hill, McCarrier's Texaco Station. It's on one side, Cata Corner, is this house. You can't see it too well because of the pine trees. But remember all the wagons that used the King's Highway? Well, this was the top of Black Horse Hill. And this place was called the Black Horse Tavern, hotel, resting place, restaurant. A lot of the wagons coming out of Philly would stop here overnight. Now, the Black Horse was considered very expensive. If you stayed overnight at the Black Horse Tavern up on the hill, you got dinner, you got breakfast, 
you had a room overnight and they took care of your horse and that cost 75 cents. Okay? That was considered expensive. 75 cents. Uh, the most famous man who ever spent time here in the Black Horse was Buffalo Bill Cody. The hero of the West. The Buffalo Hunter. The Pony Express Rider. The Indian Scout. When he got too old to do any of that, he started a circus, a Wild West show. We travel all over the country, even to Europe, showing people what the Old West was like. In the wintertime, he needed a place to stay, so he brought all his livestock to Chester County, put the horses, buffalo, cattle, on farms around this area, and he stayed here at the Black Horse Tavern. Years ago, we had an event in Coatesville around Labor Day called Buffalo Bill Days. And unfortunately, they always ran into bad weather and the, play, and the institution went broke. But people would ask, why would they call something in Coatesville Buffalo Bill Days? The answer is, because Buffalo Bill used to live here quite a bit. Did he shopping at the men's store in downtown Coatesville? If he was here, probably another one of his big stars was here too. Sitting Bull, the Indian chief, responsible for Custer's Massacre at Little Bighorn. Sitting Bull was part of Buffalo Bill's show. So was the famous female sharpshooter, Annie Oakley. There's a show on Broadway right now about her life called Annie Get Your Gun. So Annie Oakley, the female sharpshooter, was undoubtedly in Coatesville too. So this was the Black Horse Tavern up on Black Horse Hill. Big stop for people traveling from Philly to Lancaster and west. Okay, so now if you thought 75 cents was too much, you went 100 yards east to this place, which back in the day was called the Wildcat Inn. Go up to McCarrier's Texaco Station, the stoplight at Reeseville Road, Kings Highway. Turn right. You go up about 100 yards, and Kings Highway goes this way, and Barley Sheath Road goes down over the hill. This house is right at Barley Sheath Road. The Wildcat Inn, in order to stay there, it cost you a quarter. You got your room, you got breakfast, you got dinner, they took care of your horse for a quarter. The big difference was you didn't get your own bed. You had to share that with somebody. And whoever was in there first, that's who was in there. And it was somebody that hadn't taken a bath in six months, or somebody who had their spurs on or whatever, or muddy boots. But that's what you got for 25 cents. Chester County's most famous outlaw stayed many times at the Wildcat. His name was Sandy Flash. His real name was James Fitzpatrick. But he had sandy red hair. He was very fast, hard to catch. So he got the nickname Sandy Flash. He would uh, rob stagecoaches going along Kings Highway give the money to his friends. So he was called the Chester County Robin Hood. Rob from the rich, give to the poor. And everybody loved him. Nobody would ever squeal to the police where they could find Sandy until he made the tragic mistake of dropping his girlfriend and taking up with a new woman. And the old girlfriend got mad and she dimed out. She told the police if you're looking for Sandy Flash, you can find him right now at the Wildcat Inn. So the local police drove a wagon up to the Wildcat took Sandy out, put him in chains, drove him through the streets of Bridgetown, I repeat, Bridgetown, took him up to Hayti, no trial, lynched him right on the spot. He was hanged. If they'd have given him a trial, he'd have been found not guilty. Everybody in the area loved Sandy, except the girl who turned him in. Uh, if you know where the Valley Township Police Station is, that little white building up in Hayti, about 50 yards from there, on the property of a lady named High, Sandy Flash was hanged. This was around Revolutionary War times, 1775. Chester County, Robin Hood, Sandy Flash, our most famous outlaw, and this was the Wildcat Inn. Okay, next one. <coughs> Come on. We're down on the golf course in Thorndale, behind the Ingleside Diner. Remember when this place used to be the restaurant called Lucille's? Mm -hmm. Lucille's. Now it's called Buchanan's. Now it's Buchanan's. Reason? That was the home of President James Buchanan. Only one president ever came from Pennsylvania, James Buchanan. He was born in Chambersburg. His big home was in Lancaster. But he did a lot of business in Philly because he was a lawyer. And he thought he needed a house about halfway between Lancaster and Philly. So they chose this location in Thorndale. He and a man named Pym brought the, bought the property. This was Buchanan's house. Pym's was about 100 or 200 yards uh, west of that, OK? Buchanan was sitting on this porch one day when he got news out of Philly that his fiance had died. Mysterious circumstances, suicide, natural causes, maybe even murder, no one knows. 
but Buchanan was so heartbroken by the death of his fiancée that he never married. He is our only president from PA, and he's our only president who was a bachelor. Never married. This is now Buchanan's restaurant. As I said, the next time you go by, it's the only home in our area owned by a U.S. president. He was president right before Abraham Lincoln, right before the Civil War. Okay. <clears throat> We're in Wagontown. As soon as you drive into Wagontown, the firehouse is on the left, but just before you come to the firehouse, this house is on your right. It's owned by brothers now named Gibbler. But back in the day, this was called the Wagon Inn. And once more, the name of an inn gives its name to a town. Remember, we used to be Bridgetown, and Westchester was Turk's Head. Well, the Wagon Inn gave the name to the whole community, which became <coughs> Wagon Town. Big time stop on the Underground Railroad. One of my students is going in the door, Debbie. She took me out there because she knew the Gibbler brothers. We went down into the basement, a huge pit where the slaves used to hide during the day. The Underground Railroad would hide you during the day and move you on to the next stop at night. So Wagontown had its stop on the Underground Railroad too. And the next time you go into Wagontown, just as you're coming in, you look over to the right and you'll see this house. Can you check out where it's been added onto? There's the old section right there, and there's the newer part. And the date on this place is 1736. 1736, the Wagon Inn. Okay, Ms. Ellis. <coughs> Now this is the Quaker Meeting House on King's Highway, the Calum Meeting House. If you go up to the stoplight and turn right and go about a half mile, you'll come to the Calum Meeting House. Stop on the Underground Railroad. If you came next door to the Gardner House and you couldn't go in, it wasn't safe. You saw no ribbons, you saw no light on, on the, on the uh, lawn ornament, you went up to the King's Highway to the Calum Meeting House. Quakers hated slavery. They could always be counted on to hide you for the night, for the day, and at night move you on to Phoenixville. Date on this building, 1726. 1726 for the Callum Meeting House. Still operates. The slideshow you're seeing right now, I've done in that building maybe four or five times for the Callum Historical Society. Okay, Ms. Ellis. We are at Scott Field, the old football stadium, 1960. Lukens was celebrating its 150th anniversary. Lukens got started in 1810. These are the three people, these figures, who started Lukens. This is Isaac Pennock. This is Jesse Kersey. The two men who bought a sawmill from Moses Coates, where he was making lumber, and they made it into an ironworks, making iron products. These two men ran it for about eight years. Then they sold it to Rebecca Pennock, Pennock's daughter. She married Dr. Charles Lukens, and they took over the mill. Uh, so Rebecca and her husband spent a lot of money, went into debt to try to make Lukens a bit bigger and better place. And then tragedy struck, Ms. Ellis. Uh, unfortunately, when Dr. Lukens was in his 30s, he died, leaving Rebecca with a mill deeply in debt and four young girls to raise as her own. Rebecca had two sons. They both died in childbirth, a very common occurrence back then, babies dying in childbirth. She had four girls. All her friends told her, you can't raise the family and run a steel mill. You're a woman. You've got to do one or the other. Sell the steel mill. Raise your girls. But Rebecca was a hard-headed lady for her time, and she said, I can do both. Why not? By the time she died in 1850s, Lukens was out of debt. It was the number one plate steel mill in America. It still is. Lukens makes plate steel, the big long slabs. All four of her girls were raised and married. Now, two of those girls married Houstons, which is why for over 120 years, Lukens was not owned by people with the name of Lukens. Lukens was owned by people named Houston. And uh, the last of the Houstons sold their stock maybe five or six years ago. And I'm sure everyone in my class knows it isn't Lukens anymore, is it? It's Bethlehem. But I'm, by history, I keep referring to it as Lukens. We'll talk more about the Bethlehem situation in a little bit. Um, I went looking for Rebecca's grave. Figured she was a wealthy lady buried in this area. She probably has some big monstrous you know, monument, Rebecca Lukens. Not true. She's buried out by South Brandywine, Ms. Ellis. <coughs> that's it. As you go past South Brandywine and you make that bend in the road, there's that little church off to the right, a little cemetery. That's where she's buried. <coughs> and then I was told, no, she would not have anything big or showy. She was a Quaker. 
and Quakers keep everything simple. All it says on the top is her name, Rebecca W. Lukens, when she was born, when she died. And so the next time you go by South Brandywine, just take a look over to the right, and that's where Rebecca Lukens is buried. Okay. We're in Thorndale, and this is Thorndale's big stop on the Underground Railroad. There's a stainless steel company over in the West End called G.O. Carlson. Well, this is their home and office area in Thorndale. Let me get you there. Go down to the big intersection in Thorndale and McDonald's. Turn right. Go under the railroad track and start up the hill. The G.O. Carlson house is on the left. There is a tunnel that goes all the way down the hill from the G.O. Carlson house under the railroad track, under Route 30, and it comes out by that new Exxon station. That new gas station in Thorndale, the Exxon, that's how far it is. That's got to be close to a half mile. So Thorndale had its big stop on the underground. Coatesville did, right next door. And Wagontown had also at the Wagon Inn. This is the G.O. Carlson house in Thorndale. Okay. Now, Lucan used to have that sign up, which it says, world's largest plate mill. Unfortunately, after World War II, we invited some Japanese visitors to come over. They took a trip through Lucan's, and uh, they went back to Tokyo and built their own steel mill three inches bigger than the one in Coatesville. Three inches. So Coatesville had, Lucan's had to take their sign down. Japan now has the world's largest plate mill. Lucan's is still the largest in our country. Okay. Now, anybody who knows Coatesville, that's a spot you know, but it sure doesn't look like that. These are homes of steel workers. If you worked at Lucan's, you lived in one of these homes, or over in the West End, you bought at the Lucan's store. Check this stop sign. It's yellow and black. It doesn't even look, they don't look like that now. Look at the cars, okay? I don't even want to ask you where it is. I don't think you know, unless you've seen my show before. Ms. Ellis, that's what it is now, okay? That's the unemployment office at 3rd Harmony Street. Here's Gordon. Ash Park, New City Hall is over here. Back up one time, you saw me, but that's what it was. I always tell my kids, here's how old I am and how long I've been here. When I first came to Coatesville, the big Exton crossroads, you know, the big traffic mess at Exton, that was the stop sign. It had a stop sign at Exton. <laughs> Getting on and off the turnpike at Downingtown, there was one gate on and one gate off. Now there's eight. That shows you how much uh, population has increased in the area. Okay, so, and again, that's what we look like now. By the way, kids who went to Gordon, what's the name of the street that runs right in front of Gordon by Ash Park? What's the name of the street? One of the guys I just showed you on the other side, Kersey. It's Kersey Street. Okay, Pennock and Kersey started the steel mill. Kersey Street runs right in front of Gordon. Okay, Ms. Allen. That's a very interesting picture for people who know Coachville. That's the Oak Street project before it was built. This is Oak Street right here. That's where the Oak Street project is now located. This was before it was built. Check how different Lucan's looks, all the smokestacks. That's when Lucan's made steel by blast furnace. Now Lucan's makes 100% steel by electric furnace. But back in the day, all these were furnaces, smokestacks. When they would make steel, the entire city of Coatesville will be covered with smoke. Your grandma would call on the phone and say, are you guys making steel today, charging the furnaces? If they said yes, she, then she'd say, well, I can't do my wash today. Because if you hung it out on the line and took it back in, it would be dirtier than when you put it in the machine. And you'll see a slide of that in a little bit. You know, another change, everybody? <coughs> <coughs> these hills are full of homes today. Regency's up this way. Regency, okay? And these homes all over this area, they're the hills. They're not bare like that, as you see in the slide. But this is Oak Street before there was any Oak Street project. Okay. It's a little bit hard to see that one because the room's fairly light. It's a map of Coatesville in 1860. But can you see what the West End was still called? Midway. Midway. That's the Brandywine going right through town. And the West End was still called Midway until 1876 when this became a city. Okay. Next. <coughs> That's the old city hall on First Avenue called Greystone. One of the owners of Lucan's lived there. That was his house. His name was Abram Houston. Remember that name, Houston? When he died, his wife sold that to Coatesville as a city hall. And it was our city hall until about six years ago when we built the new city hall by Ash Park. <coughs> There's a problem with that building, everybody.